Academy episode 20. I always say war is won in only one way. It is ground assault. We can market this stuff. We can send out flyers. We can do social media and all this stuff. And until we're looking the, the customer in the eye and saying, you can do this, you can do this, you can lower your cost per mile. I think that's when rubber meets the road. Welcome automotive aftermarketers to a Remarkable Results Radio Town Hall Academy. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Welcome aftermarketers from North America and around the world to the Town Hall Academy Forum on how to sell 250,000 mile maintenance. Carm Capriato here, your host. If you're striving to make maintenance a larger part of your shop billings, then you're in the right place. Craig Noel, Brett Beechler, and Peter Rudloff join me in a very lively Academy episode. Hey, there's a new tool for you. If you have a question for the upcoming week's Academy Forum, send it to me at this new email address I created just for you. It's very simple. Question at RemarkableResults.biz. Couldn't be much easier. Question at RemarkableResults.biz. I'll do my best each and every week to get your question to the panel. I hope you're enjoying the audio podcast of the weekly live videos. This is the industry's only weekly live discussion forum, taking a trending topic and talking about it. If you'd like to join in on the live broadcast, join us on Facebook each and every Friday at 12 noon Eastern. Go to RemarkableResults.biz slash Town Hall for the link. If you don't know, every episode has their own show notes page. For this academy, you can find my guests' bios, link to their previous episodes, and the talking points at RemarkableResults.biz slash A020. You know, the Academy Podcast, another powerful resource for you of educational content inside the Remarkable Results radio program. Use it to improve your knowledge and success. Hey, I've got three shop owners on today's Academy. Peter Rudloff, a national automotive instructor and advisor, nationally published technical writer, and owner of Pete's Garage in Newark, Delaware. Pete has a passion for training and created the Delaware Training Group to bring technicians together in an environment that fosters learning. Pete's Garage has a reputation as friend of the local general auto repair shops, with many of them calling themselves customers. Pete's Garage is known for fixing difficult-to-fix cars and has grown more into a diagnostic destination. Pete's been featured in episode 123, 226, and the Connected Cars Academy number 18. Also with us is Brent Beechler, who's been in the automotive industry for 30-plus years and is the third generation at Beechler's Vehicle Care and Repair in Peoria, Illinois. At age 16, he officially joined the family business, pumping gas at their Amco station. Brett is passionate, very passionate on this subject. He understands the value of maintenance from a cost-per-mile perspective, and he says there's no other way to look at it. He's created a spreadsheet that shows his customer the difference between buying every four years to owning for 12 and a half years. And he's willing to provide you his spreadsheet. See the show notes for his email address. Brent recently published a book on vehicle care and repair. Listen to Brent in episode 199 and 224. That was a great interview about family dynamics with his peers, Gary Pontius Jr. and Tom Palermo. An outstanding interview. And also with us is Craig Noel multi-shop owner of three-location Sun Automotive in Springfield, Oregon. Craig graduated from Lane Community College in 1987 with a Bachelor's of Science in Automotive Repair and quickly went to work. He worked for Ford as a senior master technician and then worked his way up through the ranks as team leader, service advisor, and assistant service manager. He's also built ground-up street rods, show cars for over 30 years as a hobby. He was headhunted by the original owner of Sun Automotive in 2011 and became the GM at that time. And as of January 1st, 2017, he's now the proud owner of Sun Automotive. Now listen to How to Sell 250,000 Mile Maintenance. Hey, welcome everyone to another Remarkable Results Radio Town Hall Academy. A lot of great participants on with us today. I'm sure everyone is as curious as, as ever in wanting to discuss maintenance. I send a questionnaire out for every interview that I do with a shop owner, and on it, I ask, what's the split between maintenance and repair? And some of them come back and they say 60% maintenance which means they're making some kind of forward leaps with their customers. So it's an important strategy for, for shops 
everyone seems to want to move in that direction. The, the pundits of our industry continue to tell us all that that's where we need to go as quote-unquote cars may break down less. Yet, you talk to diagnosticians, man, and they're deep in rabbit holes, you know, fixing cars with all these challenges because it's almost like more things can go wrong. The other real interesting piece is so many shops have loaner cars with 200 and 250,000 miles on it for a strategical, psychological reason, I think. First of all, they want it to be low cost for them, but they also use it to, to show customers that it can be done. Pete, let me give you the first question. Are cars engineered today to be more reliable? Absolutely. So it's not the 1950s. It's not the 1960s anymore. Um, it used to be back in the day, if your car made 100,000 miles, you had a ceremony and you took it out back and buried it, right? But nowadays, 100,000 miles, you, you can get to 100,000 miles if you do three oil changes on, on a lot of cars. They'll make it that distance. You don't have to, you know, they, they just work a lot better, even if you don't take care of them. But if you do take care of them, now, 200,000, 300,000, 400,000, 500,000 miles is realistic on the original powertrain of your car. And the economics of doing that is absolutely mind-blowing. You mentioned in one of your talking points to me that people need to buy new cars because we have to have used cars. But when, when the customers come to you and say, Pete, I know you, you're, you're telling me I can, this thing can go and go and go but I'm bored and I need that new car sent and and I want those new baubles and toys on the center stack. Do you hear a lot of that? I do. And, and my answer to that is great. Buy a new car. There's nothing wrong at all with buying a new car. We need used cars in our market to fix. So from an auto repair shop standpoint, it's fantastic news for us if you're going to buy a new car because five years from now, that car is going to be not a new car and we're going to be fixing the heck out of it. So go buy a new car. That's money in the bank for us down the road. We got bills to pay five years from now, too. There's plenty of cars for us to fix today, but most people aren't going to be changing them out that fast, I think, anymore in, today, in today's society. Cars are so expensive that to go out and drop forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 on a replacement car every 100,000 miles, a lot of people do 100,000 miles in four or five years. So dropping that kind of coin is tough. That's got to be the magic, Brett, to uh, how you've helped your, convince your customers to keep their cars. So my next question is to you. How do we stretch the mindset of the driving population? It's pure and simple. It's education. I see it in people's eyes when they come in the door. And Craig, you're a frontline guy. Pete, I'm sure you've probably been on the front line for many years. I had a guy walk in this morning. And he said, oh, I just had 150,000 miles on it. And, you know, I always buy the 3.8 GM engines from a used car standpoint. And I said, man, we got, I said, we got a customer that comes in with two Grand Prix that have 400 and 500,000 miles on his car. And his eyes went whoop like that. So all I did is stretch his mindset at that point to go, ooh, my car has been paid for for six or seven years. I can go 400,000 miles. You sure can. You absolutely can. So it's an it's a front line. I always say war is one in only one way. It is ground assault. We can market this stuff. We can send out flyers. We can do social media and all this stuff. And until we're looking the, the customer in the eye and saying, you can do this, you can do this, you can lower your cost per mile. I think that's when rubber meets the road. So you're the talking head here. You could say that. My point is at the service counter or your service advisors, we have to open up that dialogue with the customer. Absolutely. I just sent off to my graphic um, printer three questions that I want asked to our customers, and I'm, I'm going to place them at each uh, position. And one of them is, what are your plans with the vehicle? How long do you plan on keeping the car? And that, that enters into a dialogue to where they go, well, you know, I, I think I'm only going to keep it till 150. And then we come back and say, well, why, why not 250? I never, I never really thought about it. I don't think my car can make it that long. And then that's when we go into the that's when we go into the whole entourage of explaining, hey, can I help you out? This is about helping their long-term financial status, not about us winning. And that's what I think everybody forgets when we're, and we cannot portray very well sometimes as advisors is we, we want to, what's in it for us. And we're truly what's in it for them to go, okay, if you partner with us 250, we're going to save you a lot of money. And that's Absolutely. The, the whole crux of it. And what I couldn't do the entire time is like, I put some of these numbers down on paper and until you see it and Carm, you've looked at it, Craig, I believe has looked at my spreadsheet until you see it. I think brains have a hard time wrapping around it and it looks like it's a big 
array of numbers, but there's one stinking number it comes down to. And that, that's what I love about the spreadsheet. So I, I actually have it on my phone it being it's on a Google doc. And anytime I'm out in public, I say, Hey, let me, let me show you something. When you're thinking about buying that brand new car, let me show you what's going on. So I love it. I'm glad I did it. Gary Pony on a little bit of the tweak in the spreadsheet and I love him for that. Um, but it is hands down what we need to be doing on the front line at all times with our customers and helping them. It's not about all about us. Okay. What drove you to sit down, create the formulas, think of every component here from license and, and fuel depreciation. Was it just, did you have that mathematical side to you? I believe I do. I have taught and continue to teach car care clinics and I've always known and I've read AAA and all this, all these numbers that come out. And one of the numbers that came up one time was $100,000 over the life of cars. I'm like, I want to be able to teach the people that are in my class, where does that $100,000 come from? So I sat down one night and I just said, that's it. I'm sitting down with my spreadsheet. I'm going to build all this stuff and throw it in there. And I actually did the cost per mile, the two first spreadsheets that you've seen on Google Docs. I actually did that cost per mile for my fleet potential recruits. Because what are fleets, fleets about? Their, their guys that are in charge of their fleet are in charge of reducing the cost per mile, period. That's what their job is. And making those cars go, if they say they're going 150, 200, 250,000 miles, that's their job to help that car go that long and also to reduce the amount of budget expenditures. And I think everybody would agree. Craig, we buy with emotion and we justify with facts in just about everything we do. How does this psychological part of the sale play into selling maintenance? Brett hit it on the nose. You know, a lot of it comes to us as the responsibility to be able to educate our customers. It's just like the feeling of what used to be, as P said, the 100,000 mile mark, right? They're, I think, still thinking in that term. It's our job to be able to cross that emotional hurdle to be able to now give them the same feeling as if I said to you, hey, you're, this car's only got 60,000 miles on it. What's the first thing you think about? Oh my gosh, it's got plenty of time left. But what we need to do is make that 150,000 miles feel the same way. So through that educational process, as Brett's talking about, he's 100% right. We've got to be able to educate them based upon what we have now as real data versus what they're emotionally going to think about, which is the bells and the whistles and, and the new car. But what we actually do with Brett's platform is be able to now spell it out just like a household. When you take into consideration your house payment, right? Well, you don't consider the water, the electricity, the food, the gas, and everything else that goes along with it, right? So now you get the whole entire picture. So when they put Brett's picture with their new car purchase, now the picture is a lot uglier, right? So potentially what they've got to do is now assess whether they want to pay for the bells and whistles or now feel more comfortable about investing long term. So that's where, that's where the hurdle is. That's where our job is. So how's this done at the counter, guys? You have to take a lot of time to be able to spell a lot of these things out. You know, they, they don't know. Uh, it's interesting. As you described to everybody out in the uh, Facebook world about my hobby, our hobby, my hobby, is decreasing. Why is it decreasing? There's less cars at shows. There's less moms, dads, and sons going out to the shows because they're all doing this at home, which I understand. But there's less exposure to the industry, Right. So as the common sense of change your oil, change your transmission fluid, make sure you do this, do that, as those things that have normally been taught in household kind of go away, we now have to become educators, almost parents and, and rearers of new automotive uh, kids out there to be able to really understand what's to be expected out there and re-educate re them. What's the attraction today? You know, years ago, it was the sheet metal, the beauty, the speed, the, the fact that you could work on them and, and the whole neighborhood could come over. So today, what's the attraction that brings the new generation into the automotive? You know, for us, you're right. Uh, we look at a Camaro and go, whoopee, wow, okay. But what we can see in the new generation is a complete shift. It is 100% transportation. It is get in the four doors and then what do I have inside? That's what's interesting to them. Right. So they have all the gadgets inside, whether they've got all their Bluetooth connections and all those fun creature features, whether they've got everything within the console that they're going to want, whether that be, you know, Internet and Sears radio, those types of things. And it's different from what used to be 40, 50 years ago, which is a, a whole, um, you know, culture of getting out in your car and experiencing the road. That's gone. When I see a Camaro, by the way, I think of my first car. I was a 1950 Chevy. So there you go. All right. 
Uh, mine was a 1972 <laughs> Camaro <laughs> Rally Sport. I didn't, uh, I didn't have a Z. But when I also think or see Camaro today, I think Transformer. What a shift that's going on. Carm, I point out that shift is good for our trade because the, the new the new consumer has a more economically focused mind on what's what's this costing me per mile. So they're more interested in that. Your enthusiast doesn't care what it costs per mile. So the people that just love their car, they don't care about the cost per mile as much as you know, the, the so, so they'll, and they'll change it out and they'll fall out in love with the car too. So the enthusiasts are go, oh, I love this car, I love this car. And then they have it for four or five years and they don't love the car anymore. They love something new. We don't love the car anymore because what, what is it? Is it the car companies have these ads that are te- that are bringing that whole lifestyle piece to, to people? My daughter's got 115. Interesting story. She's going to get maintenance done on it Monday. Uh, I think she's economical in mind. She says, Dad, um, new one or old one. And we went on a three-mile walk the other night, and all we're doing is we're talking about leasing versus buying. And I had to bring in, by the way, the Academy this Friday is, uh, let me go over it in my mind with you. Why (laughs) invest the couple grand that your car needs to have done to it? You know, there's a lot of preventative maintenance stuff that she's got to have done right now. And so I did the math for her. I said, if you keep this car for another 200000 I know you want Bluetooth connectivity. I know you want all this stuff. But, dearie, you're trying to buy a house, <laughs> and it ends up becoming almost an economical decision. Our economy is good, but it's not. And, and, I, and I love the whole concept of selling the economical side of making that car last two and a, 12 and a half years. Yay or nay? Yay for that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Again, Pete, at your counter, you mentioned to me that you convinced a customer to invest some money in an engine job in a truck. Yeah, so we, we had a customer with a truck that had a big diesel truck. Um, this was probably four or five years ago and uh, needed an engine. And we gave him a you know, 20 plus thousand dollar estimate to fix your truck, right? Well, I think the natural knee jerk reaction is... I'm going to get a new truck, right? That's that's everybody's natural knee jerk reaction. And uh, we don't have a spreadsheet set up quite like uh, what Brett has. I have an article that I wrote for Auto Inc. Magazine years ago that kind of deals with a similar philosophy. So we, we hand our customers that and say, hey, you know, maybe a new truck is what's best for you. Maybe fixing what you have is not what's best for you. Why don't you take a look at what makes the most sense for you? Is it you know economics? Because if you're talking about the economics of it, if, if it doesn't, if it's not worth putting in investing, because we hear that a lot, right? That myth, it's not worth investing that much money into this old car because the car is only worth so much money. Well, that's a myth. It's just not true because it's Absolutely. almost always worth investing in the older car. It's always cheaper to keep the car you got than to buy another car. And uh, long story short, he went, he, he shopped new cars. He looked at them. They were $70,000 for a replacement truck like what his was. His truck, you know, still had, a, I think it had 200,000 miles on it at the time. And he made the investment to repower it. And 200,000 miles later, he's really happy and thrilled that he made that investment. And, uh, and that's a big investment. I mean, that's a scary, I mean, think about investing $20,000 into a repair, right? Well, there, that, that happens and it still makes financial sense. Are you seeing that more with fleets too? Yeah, absolutely. I'll touch on what Pete said, because as I indicated to you, we have to cross that emotional hurdle, right? So Pete gave a perfect example of what the immediate emotional pain is when deciding to spend, let's just put a number out there, $5,000 on an engine versus, oh my gosh, I'm going to go get a new pickup because it's easy, right? Less pain. It's easy to write a check for $500 a month than it is to write the check right now for $5,000. So now we shift to Brett and now we actually pencil that out and we have to shift that emotional decision in the moment to what's going to be an economical and, and fiscal decision long term. And once they see that spread out, then it, the decision becomes much less emotionally painful and it makes more sense. And so that's our job as educators. Right. It becomes an easy decision. It does. So I think it's pretty simple. Even before I made this spreadsheet, you know, Pete, like your situation that came up, I literally, I think this is the easiest thing in the world to, to do this with people. I literally would say, they'd say, oh, it's $4,000, $5,000 for the engine, $20,000. I literally would say, hey, let's let's go amortize that. And they look at me like, what did you just say? Because exactly. that, that's that's dealing with houses. 
I'm like, let's let's do this over two years time. Let's shrink the window way down. We could spread it over five years if we want. Let's do it over two years time and it's $175 a month. What's your car payment going to be if you take on a new car? Oh, it'd be like four seventy five, and I'm like, you know, three hundred dollars difference every month. Do the math. But they're going to argue with you about le- leasing. You know, I've I've run the numbers on leasing. It's bad. And it, it, here's, <laughs> here's the whole crux of it. It's bad. It boils down to cost per mile to operate the car. Period. You know, my brother got into a situation where he got into a lease, and he wanted. To, he's he's very well off, and he wanted a temporary situation with the car, and he didn't want the sales aspect of it. It was like 60% more per mile to run that car versus going the other route of buying it and selling, even buying brand new. I mean, they've got this stuff figured out. The the sellers, the leasers, the leases, they've got all this stuff figured out. They've got these numbers figured out. And it is never an advantage to go lease unless you're in a situation where you don't want to deal with anything and you you, you start renting the car and you give you it back. You can just afford it, right? Yeah, if you can just afford it, if you have that much it. money that, hey, you know, right, it doesn't matter. And I say that about new cars. I think I'm not telling people in my spreadsheet, don't buy new cars. I am not saying that. There is a sector, and I'm a Dave Ramsey guy. There's a sector of the, the of the demographic of our of our population that can absolutely afford to, and as Dave Ramsey says, it's a percentage of income. If you can go out and write the check, by all means, go do it. I am not saying that's a bad thing. But I see these people that come to my door, and one of my texts had this masterful statement that he t- says statements to me all the time. They're one-liners, and he said, Brett, You need to accept, and this was years ago, that most people think they're going to have a car payment the rest of their life. And I looked at him and I said, I agree with you, but I don't. And I'm going to, I'm going to beat that strategy because I'm going to teach people that doing it this way is going to kick your rear end in the long run financially. And you're going to get to the end of your life. You're not going to have any retirement. I mean, there are major things that happen when you make these knee jerk, as Carm, you say, emotional decisions that affect somebody the rest of their life. And I think the average consumer can't afford to go out and buy a new car and trade it off in 60,000 miles. That's the exact reason why I built this thing. When I just listened to you, I thought of the easy button. And and you mentioned that, Craig. It's just too darn easy to go write the check and, and not worry. But aren't we that relationship manager? Aren't we really the easy button for our customer? We are. You know, the tough part, the tough part is and we'll go back to the emotional part again. Our industry, which is interesting, is not like any of, of anything else out there in the country. So let's just put it in simple terms. I tell this to my customers, um, my employees as well. People who go to Best Buy, there's a little prompt for Best Buy. You go to Best Buy to buy a big screen TV. Great. $800 later, woohoo, we get to go home, plug it in, watch the game. We get some reward from it, right? So for us in our industry, the second they run through the door, it's an immediate well, we know they have to, you know, relinquish their paycheck to be able to get their key just to be able to do the same thing over again. There's no emotional reward to it. So when you go back to the whole purchase aspect of it, it it's the same thing. It, there's no reward. And we've got to break them of what the initial reaction is to buying that new bell and whistle over that repair so they understand really what what is the real pain versus the, the, the long-term relief. And I call Brett's spreadsheet brilliant by the way but it's long-term relief but the feel good comes from us as educators in the business and if we do our job correctly as brett does as as i attempt to do every day i'm sure pete does our job is to be able to explain all that information is power and if we empower them they'll feel better about that decision and if we don't then i think we fail them and that's not fair for them Mm -hmm. long term and we talk about that we want them to we want them to have a great life, safe life. You know, Craig, that's what I was thinking when, when you were going through that just a few minutes ago. I was thinking of the value of the service advisor and how that transaction's closed out and how they left my state of mind when I got behind that wheel and spent a thousand bucks on the car realizing this is my world, this is my life, this is my transportation, this is my lifestyle, this gets me to places, it lets me earn my check, it gives me freedom. The reward is you keep going. That is correct. It's an interesting shift right now. I can't speak to Brett or Pete, but right now I've been seeing over the last probably three to six months, a shift between people finally making that decision, as Brett says, to maybe stepping up and buying that new car. And I see that going on. I haven't seen it for a couple of years. And so that's a good thing because they can go ahead and do that. But again, if, if, if we just stay in tune with that emotion and start to talk to them about that long-term 
investment, as Brett would, Brett would call it. Uh, I think we're good educators and, and uh, we're going to serve the public well. Okay, Brett, can you give us just a few highlights? I mean, what what, what are the input fields? Are there just a very few input fields uh, for you to end up coming up with? It, it, the example that I have in front of me uh, shows a lifetime driving gap or a delta of $124,000 saved in the instance of, uh, I forgot. It was a Chevy Impala, simple vehicle. A uh, large number of them are driven. I actually took that spreadsheet and I had... Uh, Five, six kids from a local Christian school that came in for a kind of like a mini semester for one week. And I, I taught these numbers. I said, Hey guys, give me your dream cars. And I slapped on all these exotic cars and trucks, you know, guys in their trucks. And like Pete was saying, that one guy's replacement truck was 70,000. One of the kids picked like an $86,000 Chevy Duramax. And I laid the numbers in front of him and he's like, Boom, like, Oh, I don't think I want to do that. And my, my magic question always is, Hey, how many hours you got to work to pay for that thing? You know, and, and I say that to kids when they're young and they're, they got very low earning potential. They go, oh, my gosh, I'm going to have to work like seven years to pay for this one vehicle. OK, maybe I won't do that. So to give you the 10,000 foot overview of this, I essentially took two vehicles and I compared them side by side. I took uh, one vehicle, I'm sorry, an Impala. And I took that habit of somebody purchasing a new car, brand new and trading it at 60,000. And I flipped that habit for 50 years, okay? That person, average miles you drive, all this stuff went into it, all the operating costs, you know, all the maintenance that goes into driving that car for 60,000, which actually is not very much when it comes down to maintenance. I, I think I recall the maintenance was uh, just under four cents a mile to drive the new car. And everybody goes, oh, that's, that's great, man. That's not, that's not a lot of money. And then I flipped it to the habit of somebody buying a car, which we encourage here, most people, buying a car at 60,000 and keeping it until 250,000 or more. I just picked those two raw numbers and you can play with these numbers all you want. So I took all those numbers and all the repairs and everything that added up and it came to about seven to 10 cents per mile. I'm going, huh? All right. Well, if I extract this out and that one spreadsheet you have in your hand, Carm, essentially Gary and I built this together and it, it's, it's really cool because I can share this with anybody on the program if they want to email. I have no problem with it. I don't want to hide it. It's not exclusive. I'll share it in a Google Doc or a Google Sheet is what it's called. But I take these two habits over 50 years time and I implement the how much gas is per gallon, how many miles per gallon you're getting. I throw in repair costs, like extra repair costs. You know, you might get a car in there like a PT Cruiser, which I would never advise anybody to buy. Sorry, Chrysler. Um, and those repair costs go way up and that number may shrink from 124,000 down to 60, for example, I'm just throwing that out as, as off the cuff. So the biggest hit I found in all of this habits is, and you, the, the four of us know this on this panel is the depreciation expense is absolutely just, it's like blowing money out the rear end. You lose so much stinking money in the first four years. The average, I saw this play a couple months ago, the average new car loses. 60% of its value. So that means if you buy a car for $34,000 in four years, it's worth $13,600. Could you imagine us buying our house for $100,000 and it being worth $40,000 in four years? No one would ever invest in something like that ever, ever. So as the old adage goes, houses appreciate, cars depreciate. What I'm trying to encourage people to do is hang on to that car as long as you can and this number dwindles way down. So we're big advocates. I've never bought a new car in my life. I'm 46 years old. I've never bought a new car in my life. My dad, who's basically the mentor, the teacher behind all these numbers with me, bought his first new car at age 67. <laughs> and he's known his numbers. Now, the guy at that age can write a check. And here you go. It's percentage of income. It's percentage of net worth. Here you go. Mind you, it was a Honda Fit. It wasn't like it was an $80 Chevy <laughs> Duramax, but it was a brand new car he's going to keep for 300,000 miles. And he's going to follow the maintenance schedule. And his depreciation schedule is not going to be as immense as somebody going zero to 60. So I took all these numbers and I threw them in there and I, I came up with this one savings over a lifetime. So this is the, my most favorite spreadsheet to show customers because they, their eyes literally get this big around when they're looking at this going, no, that's not possible. And I said, yes, it is. I can put it in concrete numbers. It is absolutely possible. Well, maybe I'll spend, I can throw in more repair costs in this spreadsheet. Okay. All right. You're going to spend $4,000 over life instead of, you know, thousand, whatever the case may be. 
And we can play with these numbers all you want, but it's still going to be a a monstrous number at the end of 50 years. Is this stuff hard to get across to your customer? Not when you put it in a simple form like that. Um, I've shared with us with, with a number of customers so they can go sit down at night when their brain's not buzzing at 100 miles an hour and go look at it and go, oh, my goodness, he's right. He's absolutely right. It pays to invest in my car to keep it long term. He's not just looking out for his business. He's not just looking out for himself. I look at that 124000 and say you got three kids. That's, that's an investment for one of the kids' college fund. And you got three or four cars in a family and you take that habit and you have that habit for life and you've already funded your college fund for all your kids, whatever you want. Or your, I'm sorry, your, your Votech school too. Retention. It seems like it is, it's almost a hook to your, to your shop, Pete. If you can get a, a customer that ingrained into understanding that you've done the math for him, that's almost a life. I know it's tough to have lifetime customers because they can still vote any way they want if they don't have a good experience with you. But they would always think about what Pete always wants to, uh, the, the good Pete always wants to have for me and my vehicle. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we're, our customers, they know that we're out for their best interests and our best interests. It's a, a win, win, win is what I like to call it. You know, we're going to fix your car really well, keep your car on the road for a long time, keep the breakdowns to a minimum. When you do break down, we're going to be there. We're going to be a phone call away, a text message away, email away to get you back up and running quickly. Our customers generally are long-term customers. You know, we have we have cars. You know, we've been in business for 18 years now. I have cars that we have been working on since 18 years ago, and we still have that same car is still on the road and still going strong. And the customers happy as can be, and it becomes a point of pride for people when their car gets you know 350, 420. You know, 580,000 miles on their car, it's a source of pride for them. And it's even easier for them to write the check when it comes time to fix it because they have this history now. Well, I've already got 500,000 miles on it. Why wouldn't I just keep going? The car does everything I need. It suits me well. It's clean. It's comfortable. It drives great. I take it to Florida if I wanted to. And, you know, so, so they have a real good high comfort of it. And I don't have to ask them of going to find a new car. Now think about that, Carm. Think about what Brett just said in one sentence about how the customer is going to take numbers and he's going to take that information and immediately switch from saying, oh, it's not about your shop. It's about me. Oh, he's my advocate. Now all of a sudden the emotion switch backs from a negative to a positive as they start going towards higher mileage. And what did Pete just say? Now they feel happy to write the check because they know long-term what they're doing for themselves. It's not about us. It's about them. It's amazing. You're filling up their emotional bank account, but you're also filling up real dollars. And you can say, listen, uh, here's what we've saved you so far. Wouldn't it be cool to have a spreadsheet on a car when they committed to do this? You say, okay, let's go this day forward and and, and add another line to this spreadsheet as to how many dollars that they're literally saving, you know, everything in aggregate, depreciation and everything, and say, well, it's time for $2,000. But listen, you you got got 12 in there. You got you got twelve in the bank. You didn't even know you had, but it's there. I bet you. I bet you know it's in your savings account. <laughs> I had a customer one time. It was oh, it was almost twenty years ago. And at that time, he said to me, "He goes, you know, Brad, I put in fifty dollars a month into an account. I don't even pay attention to it. That's my car account. And this was eighteen, twenty years ago. And now I think that number's up to seventy-five or a hundred dollars. And that's what every person needs to be doing. It's it's accruing money and just writing a check when things happen, when maintenance comes up in their cars." I look at that hundred dollars versus three, four, five hundred dollars in a car payment, and it to me it's a no-brainer. But we work in the trenches every day. We see these numbers every day, and I, we all want to get frustrated and say, "Can't you see that?" I always say that as a leader that I shouldn't be saying this verbally. Can't you see that? And I never say that anymore. Can't you see that? I mean, can't you see that? And shame on me for ever thinking that because they don't work in this business every day, and they don't see the numbers that we see every day. You know, one of the reasons why we have pods here is the exact same psychological philosophy behind what we're doing with these numbers is what Craig's saying is Pete's saying. If kind of like a bar, if I can come sit next to a guy and stand next to him, I become his advocate, his buddy, his friend. And as soon as that customer sees me looking out for them and their wallet, I have immediately disarmed them and they become my partner. And that's what I love about things like this. When we give them concrete information 
is it's, it's, it's a great partnership building tool for me. That's exactly why I wrote my book, because I want to expose the industry as to what we do right and what we do wrong. You know, I was thinking the other day, one of the things we do for our customers is I say, bring in your maintenance. I want to know your history because I'll go through it. And, and there's, a sub, there's, a, there's, a, there's a side reason why I do this, because in my brain, I'm sitting there processing. Oh, my gosh, look at all this money they spent on their car that they didn't have to spend. Oh, my gosh, this place did not do a maintenance review. They, this lady literally spent $2,000 on her car over, I don't know, forty or 50,000 miles that she did not have to spend. And I quietly said to her, you know, if, if your shop would have kept really good maintenance records, you would, you would have $2,000 in your pocket right now. And this is why I think I, I think about this all the time because we see this is and I'm sorry if anybody's watching from a dealership, but generally their mantra is sell, sell, sell. I see it all the time. And I look at this and I go, all they're doing is adding cost per mile, which gives that customer more reason to go out and buy a new car. So I look at it as a big picture standpoint. I love looking at 30,000 foot views. I go, hmm. So if the service department over here is, you know, maybe it's a nickel per mile to operate with us and it's 12 cents per mile to operate with the dealership. Wonder why they're buying new cars all the time when they can't afford it. It's not within their means to be able to do this kind of stuff. So that's why I like coming out and saying, look at all this stuff you spent your money on and we're your advocate. Pete, you and I were uh, were chatting about how many cars in a hundred are coming back for repair, uh, you know, within three years at the, at the dealership. Right now, I don't think there's any manufacturer that's operating at a production level where they have fewer than 100 callbacks per 100 cars are producing. So so what we get a lot of times when we tell people, the first thing we tell people is, hey, look, you know, we can make that car go a long time. You got 150,000 miles. You just get started, right? Well, they might look back at us if they're a new customer and say, well, you know, the thing is, is, you know, an older car is not as reliable. The new cars are more reliable. I'm concerned about that. Well, any dealership in America that you go to, any brand of car, if you go in and service their bays right now and survey, see what they're working on, they're mostly working on cars that are three years old or newer. And those are broke down cars. So if we want to talk about reliability, being a brand new car is not going to make you reliable. I have a very good customer who bought a brand new minivan. And two years ago, I get a call from him on a weekend, um, an emergency call. He's in Rhode Island, 800 miles away, and his van is broke down. And it's a two, you know, it was a two-year-old van at the time, or a one-year-old van maybe at the time. It was under warranty, but the part wasn't available. So now he was stranded. He had to get a rental car to come home, go back up to Rhode Island a week later once the vehicle got fixed. And that was a car that was a year-old car. So, so reliability is pretty much equal from a 10-year-old car that's well-maintained and taken care of by a professional shop versus a brand-new car with 10 miles off the showroom floor. I, either one of them you know, should be very, very reliable, and both of them have the potential for breakdown. So it's a total myth that an older car is not as reliable as a newer car. And in fact, we live in a time right now where the car is made between, say, like 1996 and 2007 were probably the, the best of the reliability of every, any, any era of car ever built. So, so the newer cars are just as reliable, but they're a lot more expensive to maintain and repair. But that era is just a really nice sweet spot where they're economical to repair and they last and they run forever. What you just said sparked my thought, because if I was a consumer and I was saying, well, Pete, uh, it won't cost me anything, even though it's in the shop. And that's a justification, maybe emotional one, right, Craig? So my answer to that, when they say that, well, it's a brand new car, it has a warranty, you're paying for that. You're paying for that on the front end when you buy the car. That's part of why the car is thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars to purchase. So when I think about all this great stuff that we've just talked about here, what kind of message is getting out at our service counters? Uh, you know, God, I know Jeremy and I know Barry, and these guys are service advisor trainers. Are they preaching this? It's probably fifty-fifty. You have shops like ours that know that the economics make sense to fix your older car. But you also have a whole nother set of what I would call old school way of thinking shops that are going to tell their customer that your car is not worth fixing. And I see it all the time. I get, I get clients that come to me 
with a bag full of money, the first time customer, they show up with a bag full of money and they go, Pete, I hear you're a guy that can take an older car and make it reliable again. I want to, I'm looking to spend three or $4,000 on, you know, my 10 year old vehicle. I want it to be reliable. Can you do that? My other guy that I usually go to says it's not worth fixing because it's only worth four or $5,000. Well, that mentality is just flat silly because people don't own a car with the intent to resell it. So comparing the actual value of the car to the value of the repair doesn't make any sense at all. You're not, you're comparing apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. You need to be looking, if you, if you want to talk about economics, you need to be looking at that cost per mile, like Brett was talking about. And if you're not looking at cost per mile, then you can't legitimately say it's not worth it. The only way you can get to it's not worth it is if you can make the cost per mile so much, you start getting to where you're, you know, 60, 70, 80 cents per mile. Now we can start legitimately talking about it's not worth it, but it's really, really hard to get there. Carl, I can chime in on that one. I can tell you that there, that comes from two separate schools of thought. Well, let's separate the fact that, yeah, there are cars out there where we all 100% would agree that the investing of that car isn't worth it. Okay, hands down, that's an easy one. However, I can tell you that I would bet you to say 90% of those people behind the counter, the advisors or shop owners or shop owners, technicians, advisors, whoever may be in that seat, are making the decision not based upon the customer's needs, but based upon what they would do. And that's a different, complete aspect and viewpoint because they have the ability, the technology, and the cost differential for themselves on what it would cost to repair that car for them they would say, well, I'm not going to put that much money into that car because I could do it a different way. See, they need to be thinking about it from the customer's perspective. And therefore, here we go. Now we're our, we're, we are the advocate for them based upon Brett's tool. You see the difference? I always throw this at my customer. What's your repl replacement costs? You know, in Illinois, to re-register a car, it's $220. You got to go out and do a pre-purchase inspection for 100 bucks with us. You know, you got to throw all these numbers at them and go, it's not just, oh, I'm going to just throw the keys at somebody. You know, I, I did research one time to trade a car in. Generally, a, a dealership, rightfully so, charges $1,500 to $2,000. You ever look at the, the trade-in value versus a private party value? There's a chunk of change there lost. So back to Pete's point, you just start throwing numbers at them and saying, you know, here's the deal. If the frame's not rusted and the body's not rusted, it's generally worth investing the money in it to keep it a longer period of time. And it boils down to cost per mile. That's it's it's we try to keep it as simple as possible because if I don't keep it simple for my advisors, they're not gonna do it. <laughs> they're not. Right. So in this example that that you sent me, sixty one cents versus forty four. E even though so, some of the factors are up in, in the long term aggregate, it's uh it's much more economical. Uh, we could go on and on and on, but I think we have the pure essence of, of what this was about. Uh, I can't thank you guys enough. By the way, we're, we're releasing every academy. This is our 20th. I'm releasing every academy in podcast form over the next three weeks. And uh, you, you'll all of a sudden see four or five come in your, in your feeds if you subscribe to the podcast. And so a uh, brand new audience. Everybody who's out commuting will be able to go back and, and now listen listen to the academies, which I'm excited about. Now, you had mentioned so kindly, Mr. Beechler, that you would allow someone to get their hands on your spreadsheet. So how can they do that? All they need to do is email me. And you can put it on your show. I can verbally give it right now. It's pretty simple, but it's Brett, B, B-R-E-T-T, -T, B as in boy, at... Beachlers, our company name, B-E-A-C-H-L-E-R-S.com. Brett B at Beachlers.com. So it's Brett, Brett B at Beachlers.com. Correct. And just like a sand beach, the same spelling. I've shared it with quite a few people around the country. You know, Jude Larson's got it. Jeremy's got it. You know, somebody told me one time, why don't you charge for that? And I go, why? I've taken so much from this industry. Why would I charge to give something as simple as this back? I mean, it doesn't make sense because we're all in this together. And I, I think we're all in this as an independence to really go against that whole colossal billions of dollar marketing mindset that, hey, you could have this new car too. It's such a, it's such a deceiving business model. I, 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 it just makes me seethe a little bit over the whole deal because the American cannot afford to go out and buy a new car. And the biggest deal is the massive depreciation that comes off of a car. 
It is so amazing. And, you know, depreciation is a, what's called a non-cash expense if you're talking to an accountant. It's a concept very difficult to get across to many people. Uh, thank you very much for being here, guys. I'm going to go around the room and give you all the last word. Pete, what would you be saying to someone, uh, a shop owner, a service advisor, who needs to get this, this leap going, this engaged in their business? Number one, you got to just accept and, and buy in. They need to buy in themselves that it, economically it makes sense. Um, number two, prove it. You know, put put those learner cars out there that you have two hundred thousand miles on them. When our when our customers bring our learner car back, they go, "Oh my God, that rides so good!" Right? You know, it's got road force tires and no no creaks in the suspension. We put premium brakes on it so that we don't know squeals when it stops. They they can bring our learner cars back and absolutely love them. And number three, if your customer wants to buy a new car, smile. It's okay if they buy a new car because eventually you'll be working on that car. Mm-hmm. And, that's, and that's guaranteed work five years from now. So it's okay. Now, if all of them are doing that, then you're doing something wrong because you're not explaining yourself well enough. But occasionally, you're still going to get a customer who says, you know what, Pete? It's just time. I'm ready for a new car. I want a new car. That's the best reason for anybody to buy a new car is that they want it and they can afford it. Thank you, Pete. It was a hoot as always. Craig? Yes, sir. Uh, you know, I'm going to just say that uh, we, I know Brett very well, um, look, and, and I could say probably Pete's going to feel the same way. You know, we deal with um, trying to overcome the stereotype of what a repair facility or shop really is. And I think through proper education, um, really getting in touch with our customers with the tool that Brett has, we begin to shift that perception. And that's, what's dry, that's what drives me. That's what drives Brett. Because we are their advocate, we're not the enemy. So in the end, I mean, we truly are out for them. Great point. The world should hear that. Brett? What we all need to remember as shop owners is it's a daily thing that we got to keep pounding into our people that work with us and the customers. Because we we have all this stuff in our head and we, we, we've got to be able to get it out and communicate it to the to the peeps out there that are funding our paychecks. And that, I think that's the hardest, hardest part in what we do in our business is we can tell hundreds of people. We need to tell thousands of people. I tell people, I don't even know. I'll come across people in you know, board meetings and things like that. I'm like, hey, have you ever seen this? And they're like, oh, I've never seen that before. I, I absolutely think it's a tool that anyone can use. And I, I, I did my best to keep it super simple because quite frankly, you might think I'm smart, but I don't think I'm a genius. I, I, th- I think I have the ability to be a Picasso and paint this picture to the average ordinary person that we can't afford. I mean, quite frankly, I mean, between what I do and everything, I've got two cars. One's got 220, one's got 230 on it. And I hate car payments. I literally don't like them. I make car payments myself. I'm writing a check for the next car when I buy it. And that's all there is to it. Everybody looks at me as a business owner like, oh, I bet you buy brand new cars. You know, the old misnomer of, um, oh, you can buy a new car and write it off. And I'm like, you still have to pay for it. <laughs> I, I, I lost my mind that people still think you can write it off. The old write it off ploy. It's amazing. But the average person thinks like that. So that's where they go out and sign themselves up for car payments, period. Hey, thank you, Pete, Craig, Brett, for being here. Appreciate a great, great academy. Thanks, guys. My pleasure. Yeah, I'm good seeing you, man. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time. <laughs>